Welcome to this special webinar on drug and device synergy entitled Optimal DAPT and Switching Strategy. I'm Thomas Cusset from Marseille, France, and today in the PCR studio, I have the pleasure to have with me two friends, Adrian Banning from Oxford, UK, and Olivier Varenne from Paris, France. So before starting the discussion, I would like to have your view, Adrian and Olivier, on what have been, in the last few years, the main changes in the field of antithrombotic strategy after PCI in our daily practice. Thanks, Thomas. And I think there are probably three things, aren't there? There's the stents, that we've moved on from Taxus and Cypher. We now have better stents that are safer, that don't require dual antiplatelet therapy for as long. They're more flexible and they allow us to have a better range of sizes. But we also have more complex patients with multiple comorbidities. But we've also got new drugs. We've got pills other than clopidogrel. We have Ticagrelor, we have Prazogrel. And we also have this new uh, warfarin alternatives, the DOACs. And I think that's really interesting how those three things interact. Okay, Olivier, any yeah, view? I fully agree with Adrian. I think we moved from an area where we have bad drug looting stent to an area with a much better stent, but much more complex patients, uh, complex lesions, and, uh, and complex uh, antithrombotic strategy. And now we have to adapt the strategy to the patient themselves. And we have to tailor this uh, strategy to the patient, to the clinical presentation, and to the individual patient, not to the stent, but to the patient. We have to go back to the patient and do our job as a doctor. OK, so just to summarize, many new options thanks to the new drugs, so more individualized and patient-based decision. So let's now move to the, to the case we have today to share with our, our participant to see how we apply those changes in, in daily clinical practice. And we've identified three challenging clinical situations. The first one is the optimal DAPT for high-risk ACS patient. The second one will be the optimal DAPT in the challenging situation of complex PCI in patient treated with oral anticoagulation. And the third case will focus on the de-escalation of P2I12 blockers after ACS. So let's start with the first case, which will be to discuss with you the optimal DAPT in patients with high-risk ACS. So it's a typical ACS patient I'm sure you are facing in your everyday clinical practice in your center. It's a young patient, 52 years old, with hypertension, diabetic patient, coming to the hospital for acute chest pain, who had as antiplatelet therapy before reaching the hospital, 350 milligrams of aspirin. So when you arrive in the hospital, he has no more pain, no significant estate changes on the ECG, but a positive troponin and a slight degree of renal dysfunction and a preserved LV systolic function with only uh, anterior wall motion hypokinesia. So we have a real high-risk non-STEMI patient. So the next question at this stage, Olivier, what will be your, your strategy, meaning upstream, before deciding to go to the, to the cat lab? So uh, Thomas, before going to the cat lab, this is typically a gentleman with a, a high profile risk. He has an elevated troponin. He has also some degree of renal insufficiency, which is a, clearly a, an indicator of a, a higher risk compared to the general population. He has no eye bleeding risk. Obviously, he has no anemia. He has no other sign of eye bleeding risk. So clearly, we would treat this, treat this patient with a, a loading dose of aspirin. He already received it. If the patient will uh, come directly to our uh, cardiology department, I will not pre-treated this patient with uh, either Tacagrelor or Prasugrel, uh, I will send the patient to coronary angiography within 24 hours and do the loading dose of uh, Tacagrelor uh, after uh, looking at the uh, coronary anatomy. Okay. And in addition, I would also treat this patient, of course, with uh, anti-ischemic drug and some uh, uh, heparin, either unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Okay. Thank you, Olivier. So aspirin only for Olivier in terms of DAPT before the cat lab. Adrian, any other practice view? Yeah, I would probably contrast that slightly. I'm a uh, high-risk individual, likely coronary disease. We've got echo abnormality. We've got a raised troponin. So I'm expecting that this is going to be a PCI case, probably. 
And therefore, I would definitely would preload him with ticagrelor before coming to the lab. So we had a full loading of ticagrelor with the aspirin before he comes to the cath lab, so that he's optimally treated if we wish to proceed to stents. Yeah. As you know, one of the limitations of the upstream strategy is we know that about 40% of the patient will finally not be real non-STEMI patient, and we might have bleeding risk without benefit because they have myocarditis or Takotsubo syndrome. What's your view on this specific population? And that's right. And I think that's why we take the history. It's why we look at the individual patient. But for this patient, my judgment of those risks would be that it's easier and it's also going to be facilitate earlier discharge if we load this patient before he comes to the cath lab. Okay. So maybe to summarize, we can say that aspirin for sure. In my practice, I will probably give only aspirin. That's how practice in my center but as you said, in some patients with low bleeding risk and very high probability of non-STEMI, like it's probably the case in this patient, we might consider pretreatment with clopidogrel or ticagrel or sp 2 y 12 but not prosegrel, as we, as we all know. So that's exactly what has been done in this case, and the patient was uh, transferred in the cat lab for early coronary angiography, which nicely show a clear culprit subtotal uh, occlusion of the middle AD and a significant lesion of the right. So the decision was to fix the culprit lesion of the LAD first and to stage the PCI of the right a few days later, which is the, the practice in, in our center. So the patient was treated on the LAD with a new generation drug eluting stand with a good final angiographic results, and he had exactly as Olivier suggests a ticagrelor loading dose just at the time of the PCI because the patient was not pretreated before. The right was performed three days later with a direct stenting of the mid right with again a new generation drug eluting stent and a good final angiographic result. So this young patient with non-STEMI has been treated in both the culprit and the non-culprit lesion. And we are now at the important time of the discharge of the patient. And what you will tell to your referring physician for the DAPT strategy at discharge, Adrian? So I think there's a couple of elements to this. We have to remember that uh, the DAPT is part of the therapy for this patient. It's important that the blood pressure control is good, the diabetes control is good, they're an optimized statin. All of those things are important. He's come in with an ACS, therefore he needs at least a year aspirin and ticagrelor. Okay, so one year aspirin and ticagrelor. What will be the recommendation, Olivier? I think if you follow the guidelines, uh, it's an high-risk uh, uh, ACS and a low, uh, it's not an HBR patient, so uh, I would start with the DAPT for 12 months uh, with an association of aspirin and tacagrelor. I would start tacagrelor prior to PCI, not after PCI, but after coronary angiography. This is our policy in our lab. Okay. So you identify this patient as a high-risk patient, and interestingly, we had a nice question from one of the participants who joined us today to say that whether it's a real high-risk patient. Could you comment on that, Olivier? I mean, if you look at the ESC recommendation based on the uh, elevated troponin level, I think we could qualify this gentleman as an high-risk patient. Uh, obviously, he has also some uh, mild uh, modification of his uh, LV function on the anterior wall, and I think it's definitely a high-risk patient. We can probably agree that this is not a very high-risk patient, but I think it's definitely a high-risk patient. He's high-risk okay. because of his anterior wall abnormality. He's high-risk because of his diabetes. But he's not a very high-risk, as you say. He's a young guy. He's got a very good result with two stents. So I, you know, I think the, the uh, question is a very good one. He falls yeah. into a high-risk and he needs an angiogram. But if, once we've revascularized him, we've got a very nice result with two stents. So his, his risk is no longer very high. Yeah, it's true. It's true. We know that it's challenging. And also, one, one question for you, Olivier, to make it clear for the people who, who join us today, because uh, will your decision will be modified according to the type of stent you use in the LAD and the right in this specific patient among the family of the new generation drug eluting stent? That's a, very, that's a very good question. Actually, not, not really. What we know from the, uh, uh, the latest uh, focus on uh, DAPT uh, published by the European Heart Journal, uh, European Society of Cardiology, is that you don't, you don't longer uh, tailor the duration of DAPT based on the type of stents that you're using. BMS or DES, there are actually no indication for that any longer. But you tailor your duration of DAPT to the clinical presentation. So patient being an ACS, whether you would like to use a DES or if you find some reason to use a BMS, 
probably for economical reason, you are not trying to uh, reduce the duration of GAPT. So GAPT is 12 months for patients with SES. Okay. Adrian, another comment from uh, one of our colleagues uh, who, is, who is online now. It's what is the rational to support 12 months of DAPT for this specific patient? Well, it's the ACS presentation, isn't it? I mean, that's ultimately, we don't, we, there may be more than one hot plaque. We know that angiography is limited with regard to identification of uh, hot plaque. We've done a nice job angiographically, yeah. but the data is very strong, I think, for 12 months. For a diabetic patient uh, presenting with ACS, drug eluting stent is definitely the recommendation. I would not use bare metal stent. So there is kind of disconnection, be disconnection between the stents, which are now safer, with short DAPT possible, but still, as you both said, we still need longer 12 months DAPT because of the ACS clinical presentation, correct? correct. Okay, so both of you proposed to have a potent DAPT for one year with aspirin and ticagrelor. And Uh, that's exactly what we suggest on the f report file of, of the patient to say that the discharge GAPT should be aspirin and ticagrelor for one year. But of course, during this first year and after, we can decide and modify the initial decision based on the patient outcome because some of the patient will have bleeding, some will have recurrent MACE, and based also on, on drug tolerance. So, We follow up this patient, he was fine, he was symptom free at one year, no recurrent ischemia, no MI, and no problem of safety, either bleeding complication or dyspnea with ticagalor. So the next question, and it's I think an important one and quite challenging is what to do beyond one year? Because we've seen we have a nice consensus during the first year, which is often the case, but what you will do after, after one year, Olivier? Well, clearly for me, uh, it's a young patient. Uh, his bleeding risk is very low. I think his ischemic risk is not that low because he is diabetic, he has already multivessel disease, and he has an MI. What we know from the literature is that uh, longer DAPT beyond 12 months is really beneficial in patient, especially in patient with, uh, with MI. Uh, it's reducing the recurrence of MI and even type 1 MI. It's reducing the rate of stent thrombosis. It's also reducing cardiovascular mortality in one meta-analysis. But of course, it's increasing bleeding risk. So we have to find the threshold uh, between uh, bleeding and ischemic complication. I think that in this gentleman, the, the balance is really favoring longer duration of DAPT beyond 12 months. And I would suggest to keep going on tacagwelor and, and uh, aspirin for longer than 12 months. Longer than 12 months. And you will keep ticagrelor at 90 milligrams as it will be used during the first year, or you will decrease the ticagrelor dosage according to what has been done in Pegasus, for example? As you know, we don't, uh, we don't have the, the 60 milligram dosage uh, available in, in, in <coughs> France. Probably this is what has been done in the literature, but uh, obviously I will uh, keep going on you 90 will milligrams. The 90. And right. if the 60 will be available, you will decrease, yes. probably? Yes. Okay. Adrian? I think it depends whether you really think this guy is high risk. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure how high we risk he is, really. Question. Yeah, and I think that's why it's important. So I think it also is a balance. I think it's important that we as uh, cardiologists talk to our patients. But my practice, probably, I would stop at one year, but I would emphasize the need for compliance. You know, compliance with the diabetes, compliance with the statin. My slight worry, if I keep the tacagrelo going, is I might never see him again. And how long is it going to be taken for and so I, I probably would just say one year uh, dual antiplatelet therapy and then aspirin lifelong with careful good medical therapy thereafter. Okay so it's interesting to see because we assess probably differently the risk of the patient has one of our colleagues say that sometimes we uh, don't have exactly the same feeling. So Olivier will probably keep strong DAPT with aspirin and ticagrelo while Adrian you will keep aspirin only. Just I think in for example in, in my practice I will probably try to find a compromise between your two options. And at one year, if the patient is fine and symptom free, I will probably keep long-term DAPT beyond one year, but probably not with the potent P2Y12 blockers, but I will slightly decrease the P2Y12 inhibition and I will use aspirin and, and clopidogrel beyond one year. Probably. The, one, the one thing that's quite useful for me is the psychological impact of coming off the ticagrelor is actually quite good for the patient. Young guy like this has come in, his life has been Uh, ripped apart by having an acute coronary syndrome. And to be able to say it's over, you're safe, 
you just, you know, that I put so much emphasis on taking that tablet for the first year, you mustn't miss it. Actually, it's quite positive for them to feel that they finished their event, as long as I'm comfortable that they are safe. But it is a balance, isn't it? It's always a balance. Right. But the risk of making an acute event and after one year is not zero in this gentleman. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Very good question from one of the participants to say that when we arrive at one year, we are not in the post-ACS, but we start probably the phase of secondary prevention. Mm -hmm. And are you using the DAPT score at one year, Olivier, to decide whether the patient should keep or not DAPT? To be, to be really honest, I'm not using the DAPT score, but if you're using the DAPT score in this gentleman, is diabetes, he has a, a stent less than 2.5, he has an MI, so the score will be more than two and you will be encouraged to prolong DAPT. No, I think as uh, Adrian say, it's more uh, an evaluation of your patient. Uh, what is the ischemic risk of your patient? What is the bleeding risk of your patient in taking the good decision? Uh, I think, in my opinion, this gentleman has a significant risk of ischemic complication, especially because of diabetes. We see some very severe disease with yeah. a diabetic patient. And renal dysfunction. Even, yeah, yeah, and, and mm -hmm. renal dysfunction. And uh, he has already multiple vessel disease. So I think this gentleman is very at high risk of another ischemic coronary event. That's the reason why, based on the low uh, risk of bleeding complication, I would really favor a prolonged duration of DAPT. Okay. Adrian, are you using the DAPT score in, the, in, in your practice? No. no I, 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 we don't really. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's just not really bitten into our practice. We tend to uh, look at the individual and, and make a balanced judgment, as I've said. Okay. So we have additional questions coming from the participant. We have indeed a lot of questions. So really, thank you for, for asking all these questions. The first one is, do we have evidence which have compared 6 and 12 months of DAPT after ACS? Do we have strong evidence to say that it's safe to stop after six months? Olivier? I'm not so sure. Uh, based on the, on the Triton and the Plateau uh, study, we see that the major difference between Tacaguelor and Clopidogrel are within six months, but there is still some difference between six months and 12 months. Uh, I'm not really aware of a strong uh, randomization between six months and 12 months in patients who can follow six months or 12 months duration of DAPT. We have two other questions which are more or less the same. The first one is what about, we will address the escalation later, uh, uh, but we have many questions, just one word on that. People say, could we use Ticagalor for a few weeks and then switch to clopidogrel in this specific patient, either for the patient? And we have another question which say that in his specific country, he can just get reimbursement for Ticagalor for one month. So what is your view for this specific young patient on the de-escalation after one month, Olivier? Well, I, I think the, the evidence is not favoring de-escalation, uh, especially in this, in this patient. patient. Uh, now, if it's for economical reason, uh, well, you may not have the choice. Yes. Uh, it has been tested in, uh, after MI in the Prague 18 trial. But if you uh, have the possibility of, uh, uh, of uh, getting the Tacagalor, there is quite a significant difference in terms of mortality yeah. uh, in the trial between Tacagalor and Clopidogrel. So my suggestion would be strongly suggest and to use... you are forced by economical reasons, yes. and then you can switch exactly. in, in some specific situations. Yes. Okay, thank you. So just uh, to summarize, we've nicely seen that in this case, we had a, in this high-risk patient three Decision time point, the first one when the patient arrives before going to the cat lab to decide which should be the upstream strategy. Then the second time point will be when we decide to discharge the patient and after later during the follow-up and the main question will be at one year. And we've discussed many times that it will be a dynamic decision which will change sometimes from one day because the patient will have recurrent maze of or side effect related to DAPT, and then it will modify what was the a priori strategy uh, designed to the patient. Maybe just before moving to the next case, I see that we have a, a question, just in few words, Olivier, to explain to one of our participants, what is the DAPT score and what, where it comes from? The DAPT score comes from a, a, a randomized clinical trial, which is the DAPT trial that randomized patient after one year uh, after PCI to prolong the APT uh, versus single antiplatelet therapy. And, and, and the score uh, is not actually a score to assess bleeding. Uh, 
It's a score that intend to uh, make the balance between ischemic complication and bleeding complication. Okay. So based on this score, you can be encouraged to prolong DAPT and having the benefit of the prolonged DAPT, reduction of, of uh, uh, instant stenosis, uh, thrombosis, and myocardial infarction. Or you can also have uh, the benefit of stopping the DAPT because of an increased risk of bleeding. Okay. It's to try to number and to define the balance between a bleeding and ischemic event at one But as you know, year. a lot of uh, risk factors for bleeding are also risk factors for ischemic complications, so it's not very easy yeah, to, to differentiate the bleeding complication and ischemic overlap. complications. Just, just in relevance to that point, you know, it's great that the our stents are safer, and it's great that uh, we can now start to think about reducing our uh, intensity of antiplatelet therapy sooner, but we mustn't get complacent about the risk of stent thrombosis. It's so important that we put our stents in properly, and it's so important that that early phase of uh, the initial implant is safely covered with the optimal medical therapy. And I think ultimately there is a risk of early switch uh, in high-risk patients, and we need to be careful about that. Yeah, I fully agree. So I think we can, we can now move to the second usual and Clearly, very challenging clinical situation, I'm sure you have, as we all have in our daily clinical practice, is when we have a complex PCI in very specific patient, which is now coming more and more often in our CAT lab, it's patient identified as patient with high bleeding risk. So just a classic clinical history, it's a elderly patient, 84 years old, who has as risk factor hypertension and is an active smoker. He has normal renal function, and he's chronically treated with rivaroxaban 20 milligrams daily for atrial fibrillation. He's now admitted in your institution for acute prolonged chest pain. He has no significant estate changes, but a positive troponin. So we have a patient arriving in the hospital for high-risk non-STEMI, but the clinical situation is more difficult because the patient is chronically treated with new oral anticoagulation. So I would like to ask you how you will manage this acute coronary event in patient taking chronic uh, oral anticoagulation. So I think it's clearly this patient needs an angiogram. Um, we would intend to do that from the radial artery and we will do it as soon as is necessary. So the question is, it doesn't need to be done right now. And if pain is still persistent, and particularly if there's ST change, then he needs to go to the cath lab now. Yeah. I think However, it's stable. Here if this patient's a bit more stable, in our lab, probably, we would wait 24 hours. We would discontinue the NOAC. And we would probably preload him with ticagrelor um, before taking him to the cath lab okay. with a consent for proceed. And the reason for that is this is an old patient who's probably not going to be a cardiac surgical candidate. And therefore, we'd be trying to optimize the chances of doing revascularization in the same sitting. So, so discontinuation and loading of ticagrelor, correct. as you suggest for the first patient. Olivier, would you treat this patient the same in your, in your practice? I think it's going to be slightly different uh, again. Uh, we would not stop rivaroxaban. Uh, because we know that uh, when you stop uh, anticoagulation and when you bridge to another anticoagulation, that's where you can have both bleeding complication and thrombotic complication. I, I agree that this patient needs an angiogram. And uh, based on this uh, uh, risk and elevated uh, troponin level, we will probably try to do the angiogram within the 24 hours as for the previous cases you just showed. Uh, we also would try to go uh, through the transradial approach. We would not give this patient any uh, uh, heparin, uh, unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin, and I will certainly not load this patient. I think that there is no clear benefit for loading this patient. Uh, I mean, the patient could be also be treated medically. I don't really know what the angiogram will show. And there is a risk of uh, uh, clearly uh, bleeding that can be uh, a major bleeding in this uh, elderly patient. So we will treat this patient with aspirin, keep the river rexabam, and uh, try to get the angiogram through the transradial approach within 24 hours. Okay, so it's interesting to see even for our colleagues who are joining today that uh, we can from two different experts to have slightly different view and different practice. Even if we are all aiming, the same thing is to find a good balance between the ischemic benefit and bleeding prevention. 
So you, you, you try to stop and to, to wait a little bit while Olivier, you prefer to send the patient quickly to the cat lab, keeping Rivaroxaban on board and, and not to give additional antiplatelet drugs. Uh, just to share my practice, I will probably do uh, what you suggest, Olivier. I will bring the patient within the next 12 to 24 hours because it's clearly identified as high risk non STEMI, just because of the troponin, at least. And uh, I will not load the patient either with, with P2Y12 blockers in this, uh, in this situation. So that's exactly what uh, has been done in our institution for this elderly patient with new oral anticoagulation. And we found a quite complex anatomy, as you can see uh, on the left part of the slide, with a patient who had a, let's say, critical or tight stenosis of the distal left main with a very small uh, hypoplasic uh, right. The coronary angio was performed six hours after, uh, after admission. And in this specific patient, uh, we discharged the patient from the cat lab. We took time to discuss with the patient, with the family, and of course with the earth team. Even if the patient is more than 80 years old, it's always worse, I think, to report in the file that we had a good discussion with the surgeon. Uh, and we decided to do a stage PCI in this case with new generation DS for the, for the left main lesion. And in this specific patient, we say that he has a very high risk of bleeding because he will have to keep the NOAC after discharge. So what will be your technical strategy here, Olivier? Because we know that the technical strategy might also impact the antithrombotic treatment then after. Yeah, sure. Um... I think I would try to keep this uh, case as simple as possible. Uh, there is a tight stenosis of the left main. I will for sure try to get it through the transradial approach that make a huge difference. And, and without the transradial, I would reconsider my antithrombotic regimen. Um, if uh, I could get through the transradial approach, I will certainly uh, try to use a one stent technique from the left main uh, toward the LAD with a provisional stenting on the, uh, on the circ. From here, I don't see very well, but I don't see any uh, disease on the, on the osteal um, circumflex artery. And uh, I will certainly load this patient uh, with clopidogrel because this patient is going to receive anticoagulation, chronic anticoagulation, and I will not use tacagulor with a chronic anticoagulation, even if it's, a, if it's a left main. But I will try really to keep uh, uh, one stand technique uh, for this uh, gentleman. Okay, Adrian. So yeah. I think one of the differences that we've seen in our approach has been a little bit to do with the systems in which we work. Um, in this older patient, I'm trying to make sure I can do, uh, ideally, cath and revask in the same sitting, uh, which is why I've taken the approach that I've had. Now, if I see this pattern of disease, I need to be sure that I've given appropriate consent both to the patient and to the family if I'm going to start to treat the left main. So commonly, we would stop. We wouldn't go straight on. I think that's probably right, because as you said, even some 85-year-old patients may be best off with surgery. So we would, after appropriate consent, uh, we're going to treat this. We would try and do it transradially. We would make sure that the medication was optimal, and we'd make sure that the cath lab was properly prepared to do this case with, uh, to set it up for any complications that may occur. But ideally, I want to treat with this single stent crossover, left main to LAD, and only stent the circumflex if the circumflex looks like it's going to occlude or we generate a stenosis during the procedure. You mean keep it as simple as possible to be able to lower the APT duration during the APT intensity in, in this specific patient? Absolutely. And for the type of stent, you didn't say anything about that because it's so obvious that we will use a new generation drug leading stent, I assume. It needs to be sized appropriately. So it's important that you size it to the LAD and you expand it appropriately within the left main body. So you need a stent that is capable of being extended to four, five or five because that's gonna be the size of the left main. And also it's got cells that are easy to get through if you need to get down into that circumflex. So okay. I think trying to keep it as simple as possible but also trying to keep it as safe as possible with a mind on what goes on from here. This old, older patient may require further operations in the relatively near future, and we see yeah. that amazingly frequently, that uh, we didn't know about it, but now they need a kidney operation, they need a hip operation. It's only two or three months since the stent procedure. Well, there's definitely a difference if you've got one stent in the off main versus two. Yeah. Yeah, I fully agree with Adrian, but maybe you can also use uh, uh, endovascular imaging. You need to have a very, very good result. 
you need to have a final pot to really apply the stents against the, the wall. You need to have a perfect result of your PCI. Whether it's one stent or two stent, you'll see. But uh, uh, hopefully, if it's one stent, you need to have a very perfect result. OK. So we, we have a, a good question coming back to the NGO, probably for you, Olivier, because it's more related to, to the practice you describe. Is it safe to pre-treat with P2Y12 patients with NOAC? Or shall we wait to see the NGO before taking decision? That's what you uh, describe. I strongly believe you'd better see the coronary angiogram, angiogram before loading the patient with a P2Y12 inhibitor, uh, especially in this type of, of patient, 84 years old, uh, anticoagulation. I don't really see any benefit of loading the patient with tacagulor uh, prior to the coronary angiogram. Especially in this high bling risk patient, yes. because elderly, no yes. on board. Yes. And if it's high risk anatomy, like it is in this case, we can always decide to stage and probably to load the patient before, exactly as you suggest, and to do the PCI of the left main or complex bifurcation two days, uh, two exactly. days later. Exactly. So that's, that's exactly what we, what we did in this case. The initial plan, as you said, because we were dealing with high bleeding risk patient in which we don't want to give long-term DAPT. We try to start with one stand technique, but as we all know, sometimes it doesn't work. And we end up with a two stand technique using the tap technique because after putting the stand left main LAD, the result of the, of the circ was really not, not good. So we decided to put another stand and to use the tap technique with a final pot with, as you can see on the slide, a, a good angiographic result, but as you said, we end up with a complex situation of complex PCI requiring potent DAPT and probably longer DAPT. But on the other side, we have an elderly patient with no act on board. So it, will, it might make the decision very difficult. And it's here nicely illustrated on this slide because we have on one side many good reasons to stop DAPT early, elderly patient, no act. But also we had a high risk clinical presentation, non stemi and left made PCI ending with two stand technique. So we are really in a, in a challenging situation. So I prefer to have the response from you uh, and to know how you will manage this patient and what will be your advice at the charge for the patient. And again, of course, the referring physician. Okay. So I'm going to emphasize the need which uh, for a perfect result We've done a tap and a pot, so we've done our best, which is the equivalent of a kissing balloon as well. So we know we've done a good job with our stents. But the risk of stent thrombosis is high in the first month, and therefore I would do triple therapy for the first month. So that would be aspirin, clopidogrel, and the NOAC, um, and probably GI protection as well. And I'm going to prioritize that four-week period because that's the highest risk stent thrombosis. At the end of four weeks, I'm then going to stop the aspirin and I will go with NOAC and clopidogrel thereafter. Okay, so four weeks of triple therapy with aspirin, clopidogrel, and rivaroxaban, and then you drop aspirin half, and you keep clopidogrel and rivaroxaban. Correct. And what about the dose of rivaroxaban during these first months and after? I don't have that much experience with rivaroxaban, so I'll probably just continue the, the standard dose that they came in on. Although I know you can reduce the dose, and people might do that. I'd make the point that I do not want to send the patient out on ticagrelor, NOAC, and aspirin, because I think that's too much. And I think the bleeding risk is really very high if you do that. So although I had ticagrelor in my cocktail when I did the stent, the patient will go home with clopidogrel and aspirin together with the treatment for atrial fibrillation. OK, Olivier? That, that's a very complex question. Uh, that's why I'm asking. Huh? Yeah, it, it sounds a bit. <laughs> and logical to load the patient with tacagualor and then directly switch to clopidogrel. Right. But uh, for me, um, I, I agree on the strategy. It will be one month of triple therapy to avoid stent thrombosis. We know that stent thrombosis occur mainly within 30 days. I don't say that there is no stent thrombosis afterward, but, yeah. but it's mainly right. during this period of time. And I think you have to pay the price to avoid stent thrombosis, which will be, of course, terrible in this uh, gentleman with uh, two stents in the left main. Uh, and then I will use aspirin, clopidogrel. I think I strongly discourage people to use tacoagulor on top of uh, anticoagulation, whether it's NOAC or a VKE, I think yeah. it's the same, and uh, uh, rivaroxaban. Uh, maybe a slight difference. I, I'm not feeling very confident uh, 
to use a lower dose of rivaroxaban uh, because I want to use the dose that is uh, efficient and effective to reduce stroke in, in major randomized controlled trials. So I will use the same dose of rivaroxaban. Even 20 if we know that DPT by itself will reduce the risk of stroke in AF patients, but we you know don't that think that the reduction of rivaroxaban might be covered by the DPT and it could be a good compromise during the first months? Of I'm, I'm not so sure about that. And if you look at the Pioneer AFPCI trial, and one group of patients uh, with a low dose of, uh, of, uh, of uh, NOAC, which was 2.5 times uh, BID, uh, there is an increased rate of stroke. I think it was six versus zero for patients receiving uh, six months of DAPT. Okay. So I will be very cautious to, uh, in to changing the dose of, okay. of NOAC when you want to use this dose. I mean, they're both it's catastrophic, stroke. aren't they? Yeah, <laughs> stroke and, and yeah. Yeah. bleeding can be yeah. life threatening as well. So, very practical question uh, that we have now. So, maybe first short answer, Olivier, is about the use of PPI in such patients. You have uh, NOAC and DAPT. I think it's almost compulsory. Uh, based on many, many trials, we know that the, 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 by, by far the most uh, common location of uh, major bleeding is GI bleeding, very good study from Oxford Vascular uh, study uh, actually. Uh, more than 50% of the uh, uh, major bleedings are GI bleedings and we know that PPI are very effective yes. in reducing this uh, bleeding, bleeding so you should treat this patient with PPI. Another good question is, uh, here we have a non-STEMI, so we can discuss whether we should load or not the patient with P2I12 blocker. If you have a STEMI patient coming with NOAC, would you load the patient? That's a question from one of our colleagues in the room. Would you load the patient with P2? P2I12? Yes. yes. Clopidogrel. Clopidogrel yes. for both. We yes. all agree. I will use Clopidogrel because I will use Clopidogrel at discharge. And uh, therefore, I think it's uh, more logical to yeah. use clopidogrel also for the loading dose. Okay, very interesting and very practical question. When we do coronary angiography in patients with NOAC, and also when we do PCI, uh, will you give unfractionated heparin on top of the NOAC for both the NGO and the PCI? Very easy answer. My answer is yes, but I should say that this is really based on my local practice, and I'm I'm not aware of a lot of evidence that support this uh, strategy. I think one has to be aware of the risks. Right. You know, it, and it does depend a little bit how experienced you are as a radial operator. Uh, you can see uh, if you're not a very experienced operator and your patient is, has both the NOAC and heparin, then you can get a very nasty complication. So I think you have to yeah. be very careful. The other issue, of course, is that you never know quite. Um, the thing I, I'm, if I'm going to give heparin, I don't give heparin until I'm in, and I'm you know, towards the end. Um, yeah, because yeah. otherwise, you don't know necessarily, after radi mm. radial puncture, that you're still going to get in the, in the femoral artery. And you don't want to be trying to get into a difficult femoral artery with 5,000 of heparin in and uh, pixaban. It's, 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 yeah, it can it's, be a real problem. We have, we have some small evidence from the Futura Oasis when we've seen that the anti-10A was not enough, and we have some clot on the catheter. And from this study, they suggest that we should give and fractionated heparin for both the NGO and the PCI. And that was one of the, of the colleagues who, who has this question. We have a comment coming several times, just to say on one word, we, we discussed a lot the difference between clopidogrel and ticagrel or for the first case. So we had the question and it, it, we have it again now. Uh, do you think there is a mortality difference between the two groups? This is just hypothesis from Plato and Pegasus. Or was it the primary endpoint of the study? That's the question from one of our colleagues. Olivier, what do you think? I, I don't really understand the question, actually. Do you think the mortality di difference observed in Plato and Pegasus in favor of Ticagrel or compared to Clopidogrel is relevant? Or is just hypothesis because it was just secondary endpoint and the study was not sized to assess the mortality benefit. You, you mean in in, uh, in Plato and in Pegasus? Plato, but Plato, in Pegasus, there is no difference in no. mortality. Numerically, that I'm aware. Uh, no, I think uh, yes, there is a difference. This, I don't have any explanation, very clear yeah. explanation. But all the endpoints are going into the, in same, the same direction. direction. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, fully. Agree. It's biologically plausible, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So just to, <clears throat> to share with you, and that's good to see that we had a, we had a good consensus, at least here, uh, to say that this patient, we decided to treat him 
with one month of triple therapy because it was still a non-STEMI patient with left main two stents. So we decided that the pioneer or worst approach without aspirin in the first weeks is probably not as safe as it can be. But we decided to decrease the dose of rivaroxaban. We've discussed that already, and we had also questions from one of our colleagues to say if we can decrease to 15 or 10 milligrams of rivaroxaban. But as you said, Olivier, we probably decreased the protection against stroke related to EF. So it's always a, a compromise. So we just decreased to 15 for one month. And after, exactly as you suggest, we drop off aspirin and we just keep a double therapy with rivaroxaban 20 and clopidogrel as single antiplatelet therapy between one and 12 months. So again, the patient was follow and was fine at one year, no bleeding complication, which is good in this kind of elderly patient taking so many antithrombotic drugs. And the next quite difficult question is what to do beyond one year? The patient is fine, he's taking rivaroxaban 20 and clopidogrel 75. What would you do for the antithrombotic strategy in this AF patient with two stents in the left main? Olivier? I I mean, the, the real answer is we don't really know. Exactly. Uh, I, I think it's very really difficult. Uh, the, the situation is complex because uh, he has two stands in the left main. It, it's also very emotional to, to totally uh, interrupt all antiplatelet therapy. And I think that will be uh, uh, very tempting to uh, continue at least clopidogrel few more months if the patient did not uh, experience any bleeding. But I should also say that the recommendation of the ESC at this stage are to stop uh, any antiplatelet therapy to keep going on anticoagulation. I think in my own practice, I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable to keep the patient only on anticoagulation, especially when it's a left dominant system yeah. with a, a stent in the left main, and probably I will, I will keep going on, on clopidogrel for a while. So unless very high bleeding risk, you will keep oral anticoagulation for the atrial fibrillation mm. and clopidogrel for the stent and the coronary artery disease, correct? I think, I think the difference between five years from now and, and now on is, is, is the antiplatelet that I will use. Maybe five years from now I was using aspirin yeah. and I, I quit mm. clopidogrel. Yep. Yep. And, and because of the risk of GI bleeding, I'm using a more potent uh, antiplatelet therapy that is less gastrotoxic. So I will keep going clop clopidogrel yeah. uh, in addition to rivaroxaban. And if any bleeding occurs, then you will reconsider, as we said, yes. as a dynamic decision yes. whether you can stop or not exactly. the antiplatelet. Yeah. Adrian? Yeah, I think we have to look at the patient. I mean, you're right. But if this patient's not covered in bruises and it, it is very robust, um, two stents in the left main, I would be uncomfortable about stopping uh, the uh, clopidogrel. If it was a slightly you know, different scenario, you've got a small lady who's covered in bruises and has got a stent in the mid-right coronary, then perhaps I'd be happy to just take the river oxaban and be done. Um, but I, I think I would be uncomfortable with two stents in the left main having no antiplatelet therapy, even at one year. I think I would look to at least one antiplatelet drug. But as you, I would share exactly what you've said, which I've switched really from aspirin in combination to clopidogrel in combination. Okay, so interesting. Same view. You will keep one drug for each, for each disease. Interesting because in this case, we decided just to keep no I, alone and to stop clopidogrel. We've seen that we can discuss that extensively. The guidelines are going in this direction, but in clinical practice, we are a little bit afraid of the late stent thrombosis or recurrent coronary events. So in my practice, more often I do exactly what you suggest, meaning I keep one drug for atrial fibrillation and one clopidogrel for the coronary artery disease. But for this specific patient, I consider this patient as high bleeding risk so that's why I decided to keep just one drug to try to, to cover both diseases. But of course, that can be, uh, can be discussed. Yes, Olivier? Maybe one point two. I would be very careful on his renal function as well. Because as time is going, exactly. uh, she's uh, 84. She can very well have renal insufficiency. And then you end up with a very higher risk of yeah, bleeding, uh, especially with reverence. The other thing is the compliance thing. You know, I think if you're... If you've got clopidogrel and rivaroxaban, everybody knows there's a reason. Whereas you're just on that, then people kind of forget and the patient goes in to have their hip done. Oh, you'll stop that a week before. Uh, you don't need that. And then all of a sudden, they've got no antithrombotic drugs and they're having a hip operation. Well, that's really risky. 
So it does it does it does function as a as a, as a warning light to, uh, to to say that this patient is different. And actually, you know, this, you've done a fantastic job putting in two stents beautifully. We just need to look after them. But the story is not yeah. over or just when yeah, exactly. you put the stent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You mentioned that briefly, Olivier, but we had also a question uh, asking whether we have evidence or not for this time period beyond one year to say whether it's safe to use NOAC alone or should we use NOAC and antiplatelet agent? I think that um, <clears throat> that except uh, the the uh, ESC recommendation, we we are missing very strong data to yeah. support this. It's it's more an expert consensus than uh, uh, evidence based medicine. Yeah, exactly. We know that there is study which are launching and going, but so far today we don't have evidence to to support that. So just <clears throat> to summarize this second case, it's interesting to see that. In this high bleeding risk patient, we identified the same three decision time point as we had for the first case, which was very young patient, in which most of the clinician of the decision were based on the very high ischemic risk profile of the patient. And for this second patient, we took it completely the other way around, and most of the clinical decisions were based on the bleeding risk related to age and of course to the fact that the patient was chronically treated with a uh, rivaroxaban. Mm -hmm. So I think we can now move to the, the third case and the third challenging clinical situation is about the use of the de-escalation, meaning changing the P2Y12 blockers between hospital discharge and one year after ACS. And just to address this question, we have a, a case, a usual case, Elderly patient, 81 years old, STEMI with multivessel disease, is diabetic patient and active smoker. He had prior history of GI bleeding in 2011, and he had, for the STEMI, a drug eluting stent in the LAD, the right, and the obtuse marginal branch. And he, in hospital, and even before reaching the hospital, he was treated with DAPT of aspirin anticagalol. So the question for this patient is, what will be your discharge therapy? And what about the de-escalation concept, Olivier? Uh, my uh, recommendation for this patient will be uh, DAPT, aspirin and tacagulor. Um, what I think about de-escalation, I'm not so much convinced about the, the data on, on de-escalation. I think it's good to reduce uh, minor bleeding. But uh, I don't think there is enough evidence to support the fact that this is not associated with an increased risk of ischemic complication. You see this patient, multivessel disease, STEMI, diabetes. So it's a very high risk of recurrence uh, in ischemic event. In addition, it's a very high bleeding risk, especially because of the uh, prior GI bleeding. So maybe an alternative uh, strategy could be to reduce the duration of uh, DAPT in this patient. We have seen in, in different trials um, assessing new generation drug coated stent and drug looting stent. Even so, those, those trials were not performed to compare different duration of, of DAPT that you can use those <coughs> stent in those patients with high bleeding risk, even after uh, uh, ACS, with reduced duration of uh, DAPT in leaders free, it was one month. In senior for patient with uh, acute coronary syndrome, it was six months. So I think that uh, in this case, I would probably uh, reduce the duration of DAPT after uh, discharge, and I would not forcing a uh, uh, de-escalation de strategy. So to make it clear, what will be duration and type? for you, for this patient? Aspirin, tacagualor for six months. Good. Adrian? Okay, uh, I think it's difficult, isn't it? This patient's <clears throat> clearly got a significant risk um, of stent thrombosis and a significant risk of further events. You know, 81, diabetic, still smoking, um, stents in all three coronary arteries. I'm looking for an option that will give me at least a year's dual antiplatelet therapy. I personally don't have very much experience with a de-escalation, but I think it's something that's interesting because the curves, the major benefit of ticagrelor versus clopidogrel is early. And so I think it's something we should be thinking about. And I know you have some experience with it, Thomas. Yeah, exactly. Exactly as you said, when we compare the benefit of clopidogrel and the more potent P2Y12, 
we see that interestingly we have the main benefit with the new drugs in the early phase right. and mainly the first months as we said earlier we know that the risk of stent thrombosis will be mainly in the first months more than 80 percent of stent thrombosis and interestingly the the bleeding hazard associated with the new p2i12 blockers will appear later in the chronic phase so we have a early benefit and a late increase of bleeding complication and that was the rationale to test the, the concept of de de-escalation, which in limited sample size studies that what we should acknowledge like topical or tropical ACS, we still show a benefit in terms of reduction of bleeding complications. Minor bleeding complications. Yeah, it's true. It's true because of the sample size, it was mainly reduction of minor bark 2 bleeding complications. But still, I convinced that these bleeding have a strong impact on the quality of life of the patient and also on adherence to the drugs. So that's why we are quite convinced what, that what, the de-escalation is a good option in, so, in some, in some patients. What we know from the Tracer trial, where they compare mortality associated with bleeding and with uh, MI, I mean, there is a, a clear uh, uh, disadvantage of bleeding, especially uh, if it's 3B and more meaning that for, for bleeding bar 2, it's not impacting uh, no. mortality as much as, as MI. So I think we should keep in mind that those trials, uh, the topic trials, the tropical, and also the PREC-18 that has been uh, designed a little, a little bit differently, uh, show a reduction in minor bleeding, which can be fine, but th we lack the power of, of showing any incidence on the ischemic complication. And I think we should be very careful in that because as we said earlier, yeah. the duration of DAPT is uh, longer duration of DAPT is also associated with a reduction in ischemic events. But it's a pragmatic response, isn't it? it and is. there are other benefits. I yeah, think, of, course. Yeah. of course, it is. of it course. Is. No, I fully agree that we need more evidence to support the de-escalation as the routine strategy, right. but still in selected cases, and I will share with you why I think this patient is probably a good candidate. But before, just short question to you see any room for platelet function testing to decide whether we should de-escalate or not? It's a question that we have from one of the participants. Actually, it, what about it, 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 it has been tested in, yeah. the, tropical, uh, in the tropical trial. Uh, the subgroup analysis in the tropical ACS, it's, it's uh, kind of uh, disappointing. There is uh, not yeah. so many difference. There is not uh, evidence of reduction of major bleeding in this, uh, in this trial and no difference either in ischemic complication. And we have also the Antarctic trial that has yeah, tested exactly. the platelet function test. So this is why it is uh, not recommended as a routine test uh, by the, uh, the ESC uh, guidelines. So yeah, I'm so not fine. recommending this. So I guess. OK. So maybe just uh, to discuss why this case is probably could be a good case, at least in which we could discuss the de-escalation concept. Because we have on one side elderly patient, prior history of GI bleeding. So clearly we should probably give clopidogrel because it's HBR patient, so we don't want to give two potent drugs. But on the other side, we have a really high ischemic risk patient, diabetic patient, STEMI, so high risk ACS by definition, and multivessel disease PCI. And for this reason, we want to give clopidogrel, uh, prasugrel, sorry, or ticagrelor. So it's difficult to decide which is the good option. So we still believe that a good compromise should be to give an early potent DAPT with aspirin and ticagrelor for the first months, for the first few weeks, and then to do de-escalation to clopidogrel, then to find a good compromise between early efficacy to cover the, the phase of the risk of stent thrombosis, and then after, good compromise between secondary prevention and avoid a too high uh, risk, of, risk of bleeding. And also we could think that we have other potential advantages of the DAPT de-escalation. Of course, we could prevent bleeding complication. We can reduce either side effect associated to long-term potent DAPT, like ticagrelor related dyspnea. We might be able to do more often invasive procedure, because when we keep patients with potent drugs, it's more challenging. We know that we will improve the adherence of the patient. And also, we had a very nice comment from one of our colleagues today saying that in many countries we have also economical reason which will lead the decision to de-escalation and indeed we will clearly reduce the cost of the DAPT with the, with the de-escalation. And we have two different ways to see the de-escalation. 
For this patient, it was a planned de-escalation, decided at discharge, to try to prevent the complication and the side effects. But very often, we have also to do reactive de-escalation, meaning we want to give aspirin and ticagrelor or prosugrel, and because something happened, bleeding or dyspnea, then we have not to prevent, but to react to the side effect, and then to use a de-escalation because of the patient outcome. So maybe before uh, concluding, I would like to have from you, Hadrian, from the participant who joined us today, uh, what will be for you the key memorable message to get back from this webinar for their uh, daily clinical practice? I think it's been a really useful overview of the whole complexity of the situation. I think we've seen uh, and discussed how ultimately the patient has moved to the centre of our uh, world with regard to considering which for individual patients what's the best way forward. And I think that sort of mirrors some of the changes in oncology, for example, where personalised medicine is becoming the, the norm. And that's what should be happening in interventional cardiology. We should be looking at each patient and we've thought about the three time points where each patient's anticoagulant uh, strategy should be considered before we take them to cath lab, yeah. at the time at which we discharge them from the hospital, and at the end of that one-year period for ACS patients. And it's been a really fantastic overview of all the things that we need to consider, but ultimately putting the patient in the middle of the uh, discussion and in the middle of the focus. Thank you, Adrian. Olivier, will you? I, I fully agree with Adrian. I think what is really striking is that we have the same recommendation. We know the recommendation, the AC guidelines, and there is still some difference in the way we interpret the risk of the patient, uh, the presentation of the patient, and I think this is a beauty of our job. Sometimes yeah. we call them, yeah. we call us a plumber. We are not plumbers. We need to <coughs> think a little bit how to treat the patient. I fully agree with Adrian. We have to place the patient again at the center, at the center of our decision. We see that there is some very complex uh, scenarios and, and history of um, high-risk patient, complex situation, and one-size-fits-all. I think this uh, one-size-fits-all strategy yeah. is definitely dead, and we need to really adapt our strategy, our PCI strategy, to every single patient. So That's I like the concept to put the patient in the center of the decision, meaning that we are cardiologists doing intervention and not interventional cardiologists, probably. That's a new, <laughs> that's a new concept. So we have now reached uh, the, the end of the PCR webinar on drug and device synergy entitled Optimal DAPT and Switching Strategy. So on behalf of Adrian, Olivier, and myself, I would like to thank first, of course, all the participants who join us today and who send so many very useful questions and comments. Really, thank you for that. Really appreciate. And also, thanks to the PCR team and thanks to Boston Scientific for the support of this educational program. So thank you very much and all the best from the three of us. Thank you. Bye-bye.